You're listening to a sermon originally recorded by Schweitzer United Methodist Church in Springfield, Missouri. Check us out online at sumc.co. And if this sermon blessed you, be sure to share it with someone else. Thank you so much for listening. Now, on to the message. Good morning. My name is Jake. I'm an associate pastor here at Schweitzer. Welcome. Really uh, glad to be with you here on Pentecost Sunday. That's why I'm wearing red. I see a lot of you failed uh, to, get, to get the memo. Um, like Tiger Woods, uh, Christians wear uh, red on Pentecost Sunday in particular. So uh, just so you know for the future, have fun with it. Uh, we are reading from a text uh, where the Spirit of God does some amazing things. And uh, although we know the Pentecost and the story of Scripture happened in the book of Acts in, in chapter 2, we get that whole story, uh, chapter 1 and 2. Um, the Spirit of God fell like tongues of fire. You know that whole story. Um, there, there are many other stories throughout Scripture where the Spirit of God does wonderful things. Um, and one of these is a scripture that many of you have uh, probably heard and know very well, um, it's, and it's from the, uh, the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. Uh, I'll give you a brief little bit of context. Ezekiel was a priest in Israel in the uh, 7th century uh, BC, right? So like 600 some ish BC. And uh, this was right around the time of the Babylonian exile. So the, the Babylonians, they came into Israel, they invaded, they took a bunch of people there, specifically a lot of the leaders in the nation, and they took them as captives and brought them back to, Ab- to Babylon. And uh, Ezekiel was one of those people. So at the beginning of the book of Ezekiel, he has been in Babylon for five years at this point, away from his people, away from his homeland. Um, it's a tragic time for Israel in general. And uh, at this time, Ezekiel begins seeing visions. Um, and he is anointed as a prophet of God to speak the word of God to the people of Israel. And the text we're about to read is known as the Valley of Dry Bones. Uh, Like I said, many of you will probably be familiar with this text. Before we read it, um, I ask that you pray with me. Lord, we humble ourselves before you today. We ask that through your word, you speak to us a new word. You speak to us new life. I pray that you open our eyes, you open our ears, and you soften our hearts so that we might receive your word gladly and respond obediently and joyfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the words here um, from Ezekiel 37, they'll be on the screen. You may follow along if you'd wish, but um, you know, this, is a, this is a vision too. And sometimes if I'm following along, I can't really use my imagination as well if I'm, if I'm looking at a screen. So feel free, if you're not too tired, to close your eyes um, and, and just listen as I read. Um, and if you'd rather, you can, you can look at the screen too, okay? So here we are, verse one. The hand of the Lord was upon me. And he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them. And behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley. And behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh, Lord God, you know, or you know. Then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, behold, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you or muscle upon you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord." So, Ezekiel says, I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, 
and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. From dead, dry bones to an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, Israel says, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. Remember, they're in exile. Therefore, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, O my people. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, declares the Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. So, the first verse that I want to look at here in particular is verse 11. God says, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are indeed cut off. This is the mental and the spiritual state of Israel right now. They feel like God has abandoned them. They feel like God has cut off, has cut them off, and they feel like they are completely without hope because of the circumstances in which they are in. Now, I want to say to you that it's very important, I think, this morning. And it is that some of you in this room will not be able to relate to this message. And it's because you have a false sense of vitality. When you look at your own life and your spiritual state, when you look at even the life and the state of the church, whether it be the whole church in America or this very church here, Schweitzer, you will say to yourself, it's not all that bad. You're generally uh, pretty comfortable. You're generally pretty content with life and the way things are. And if someone were to ask you how you're doing spiritually, you'd say, you know, I'm doing all right. I'm doing pretty good. And how the church is, well, you know, we got a pretty good kids ministry and worship ain't that bad. Preacher's okay. Music's, music's good, you know. And we come an hour uh, or so every Sunday, maybe even help serve these few areas. And, and generally speaking, you know, I, I find I, I, I get fit with church, just as it is. And so you look at this story of the dry bones, and you say, well, well, I see little sprouts of life here and there at Schweitzer and in the church as a whole, and even in my spiritual life, and it's not, it's not totally dead and dry like in this story, you just won't be able to relate. You just won't be able to relate. You don't understand that how much a revival is truly needed. And the, all I can hope and all I can pray for you is that you would become uncomfortable. Is that God would open your eyes and your ears and that he would soften your heart and that you would see uh, <laughs> the kind of life that God has designed his church to have in his spirit. And there are many others in this room who with me, we, we see not just the valley of dry bones, but we see this exceedingly great army that was made. God has given the, the vision in our minds of what the church was designed to be, who the church was designed to be, and it was an exceedingly great army. God has cast the vision in our minds, and we know deep down, and we long for deep down this kind of church. We know that a a church that's alive is a church that doesn't just come to consume a product and get their needs met. It's a church where every person is not a consumer of a product, but a member of a body. Gathering to serve one another, to give before they receive, It's a group of people who love, not just in the way the world loves, but they love one another like Christ loved us. 
even unto death. We know a church that's alive looks more like a family than it does friendships. In fact, if we read scripture appropriately, I believe that the church, our brothers and sisters in Christ, are more so blood relatives by the blood of Jesus Christ than our very own blood relatives. That's a church that's alive, my friends. We know that a church that's alive obeys the word of God. We know that a church that's alive reveres the word of God and seeks to live lives of holiness. And in doing so, the culture sees this church and they see a peculiar people, do they not? Peculiar. Friends, is your life, is our church, is this body peculiar to the people of Springfield around us? Is it peculiar or do we look just the same? I'm convinced that too many Christians are, are convinced that we look p- peculiar, but when the rest of the world looks at us, they just say, what's different? We know that a church that's alive fears God. I think of the story of Ananias and Sapphira, if you know it, from Acts chapter five, I believe, maybe six. Um, where Ananias and Sapphira, they bring their gifts saying they sold their land and they bring their money to God and they lied about how much it was. And what happens to them? The Holy Spirit, Spirit of God, strikes them dead in a moment. You're like, that's Old Testament stuff, right? No, that's New Testament stuff right there. The Spirit of God strikes them dead and the immediate result is that all who heard this in the church and outside of the church were struck by the fear of God. There is an awesome God that we worship. And it should strike fear and trembling in our hearts to follow this kind of God. The ground should shake beneath a church that's alive. No, that a church that's alive grows. Friends, the reality is that um, only 1% of all church growth in America, 1% is actually from new believers. The other 99% is, uh, is from kids being born, which is great, but it's not a success necessarily, <laughs> and, uh, and from getting Christians from other churches, which I'm more than happy to get, you know, to build this body and take Christians from other churches, but, but, but not really, you know what I mean? It's like I, I want people to find a place to blow, but that's not building the church as a whole, right? I've been reading the book of Acts a lot lately, and it's like thousands of people being saved each day, and um, it's just amazing what God uh, accomplishes, not just in that book, but elsewhere in the world today where the Spirit of God is alive. And so I could go on and on and on. The, the last thing I want to say here is that a church that's alive is a church that prays. Not where the pastor prays or where the really uh, holy and really old people in the church pray because they have time, but where every single person Every single Christian, every brother and sister sitting in these seats is a prayer, is a prayer warrior. You hear me? That's a church that's alive. And it's not just a church that prays, it's a church whose prayers God answers even more. It's a church that doesn't need new ministries or better preachers or a new pastor even or or better music or better outreach programs or whatever to grow and to thrive and to do God's work in this world, but it's a church that relies on the power of God to accomplish his work within us. That is a church that's alive, my friends. And if this is the vision God has cast in your heart, then you can't help but look at our church. The Church of America and the church in which Schweitzer is included. And at times, see a valley of dry bones. We just have to be real about this. And so today's message is for you, if you're with me on this. And this is not a message of of condemnation or of criticism or even of despair. It is the exact opposite. God asks the question to Ezekiel, son of man. You hear this question, I'm gonna ask it to you right now. Son, daughter of God, can these bones live? Can they live? Well, Ezekiel, he says, oh God, you know. 
I think Ezekiel really thinks, not a chance. Very dry. There were very many bones all scattered throughout this valley. valley. And Ezekiel's thinking, not a chance. But he knows, like you and me, well, God's all powerful, right? God can do anything, so I can't really say no. (laughs) I know it, like technically, it's possible for these bones to live. Technically. So God, you know. uh, And you guys ever felt like that before? Like there's this uh, tall order (laughs) that God has for for you, for those who follow him, for the church in general, and just anything, any prayer you have. And it's like, God, I know it's technically possible by your power, (laughs) but in your deep, deep down, you just, you really doubt that it is. I need to confess to you that I've really been wrestling with this text. As I've already uh, told you, I, I see and I, I feel and I'm a, a, a valley of dry bones and have for a long time in the church. And this isn't the first time you've ever heard me, you know, talk about this. So it's no surprise. But I, for too long, have responded, oh God, you know. I think we've all responded for too long. Oh God, you know. And, and it, based on our own personal experience or a number of other reasons or whatever, we just, we, we, it's so hard for us to believe that God can make these bones live, truly live, like the kind of life that I was just talking about. But how does God respond? He says, undoubtedly, unequivocally, unashamedly, yes. Yes, these bones can live. He says, and, and, and how's it going to happen, folks? Is it going to happen by uh, the new pastor that comes after Bob leaves? Is it going to happen uh, by having better music on Sunday mornings? Is it going to happen by improving our kids and youth or our outreach ministries? No. God says, I will put my spirit within you and you will live. This will happen by nothing other than the power of the Holy Spirit that has been given to each and every person who repents and believes in the name of Jesus Christ. To all of us. God says, I will do it. Thus declares the Lord, I will do it. We know that he did it 2,000 years ago. We know that he's still doing it today all across the earth. In fact, Christianity is thriving in many other places on the globe where even signs and wonders that we read about in the book of Acts are happening today, where dead people are being raised, where the blind see, where um, all sorts of wonderful, incredible things uh, help entire villages of people to believe when they see the power of God made manifest among them. Friends, that's what it means for God to show up. That's what it means to rely on his power. That's the very thing that God will do in our setting, in our church, in our country, soon enough. But it can't be soon enough. I mean, it cannot be soon enough. I love this. He casts the vision to Ezekiel. He says, I will do it. But then he tells Ezekiel, but you've got to do it too. He says, prophesy, right? You've got to do this too. I'm, I'm coming more and more to believe that God not only will not, God cannot accomplish his will on earth apart from humans who believe, apart from yours and my faith, apart from the words spoken by his vessels on earth, by the body of Jesus Christ, for his will to be done. And I've been learning this new kind of prayer that we're gonna do together this morning as we finish worship. And um, this prayer begins with the idea that we never say please more than once. 
This is new to me. A woman named Agnes Sanford from the uh, 19th century. I was reading her, 20th century, sorry. I was reading her book recently. She says, never say please more than once. And she was a healer. She saw the power of God uh, made manifest in all sorts of ways. When you make a request to God, believe that as he said multiple times, you will answer it. And after you make the request, know that it's been made and start saying thank you. Continue praying. Keep that vision that God has given you for health, spiritual or physical, for well-being, for vitality, for life in all areas of life. Keep that vision and cling to it tightly. Do not let go and start saying, thank you, God, that by your spirit and your promise, this will come to fruition. Who among us, brothers and sisters, will cling to that vision? Who among us will relentlessly pursue this vision of life that has been promised to the church of God and that the world needs so badly? Will it be you? And will you pray with me this morning? Will you prophesy with me this morning to these dry bones, to the very spirit of God for him to fill us with life? Let's pray. Lord, this is your will. We all come before you and confess that we have been uh, too content. We confess that we uh, doubt. I think I can speak for all of us, at least to a degree. (laughs) We confess that we have sinned, we confessed so much. But we also confess. We also confess Jesus Christ as Lord. We testify and believe in the spirit that you have sent for us to receive, that you live within us and among us and that you will do what you have promised to do. Father, I pray this morning that you place your vision for what and who the church should be in every heart and mind this morning, that you give us that vision. Here is a body. Help us see it, help us imagine it, help us long for it and love it and cling to it and never let it go until your will is accomplished. Give us that vision this morning and let us take it out into the world for your glory for our enjoyment. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.